just wait for the recording. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Well, thanks everybody for uh, having me, and thanks uh, Taylor and and Spencer and uh, Andy I, I, and Hannah. I hope I'm not missing anybody. Appreciate the opportunity. This is it, in a lot of ways. It feels like coming home. I, I feel like I'm back with a bunch of, of old friends, and it's fun to be to be back together a little bit and catch up on on where we've been and what we've been doing. So, just really quickly for those of you that don't know me, I I've been in high tech uh, startups in that space for a long time, um, all, all my career, and a large part of it in a university environment where um, I've had the the fortune of being a part of or misfortune, depending on what you the brain damage that goes along with it, but being being a part of uh, about 350 startups. Um, also had an opportunity to do some consulting for a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And so what I'm going to talk about today comes from a combination of all of those different sources. And, and, and I'd like to start by saying something that might seem controversial when I first say it, but after you think about it, you'll probably be like, you know what, I get it and it, and it makes sense. But um, I've come to believe that the difference between long-term successful organizations is the ability of getting speed to objective. So if you have strategic objectives, the ability to get there faster than your competitor is the difference between sometimes living and dying, but certainly growing and stagnating. I think that's true whether you're Marriott or whether you are a two-person startup. I think the same principles apply. And in fact, of the things that I'm going to talk about today, nothing I say will you be like, oh my gosh, that's the dumbest thing ever. That doesn't make any sense. On the contrary, you'll probably be like, you know what? That's completely obvious, Brian. I, we, I've we i already known this for a very long time. But I'm going to say that what I'm going to talk about, these principles, they say easy, but do really hard. And so what I really want to get to, what I hope you'll leave with today is some tools on how to implement these principles in ways that will really benefit your organization. Whether you work at a very small company or a very large company, I think that they're the same um, as you go forward, okay? So um, with that premise in mind, I'm gonna uh, share my screen if I can here really quickly and share a, a presentation, which I'm also happy to send out to uh, anybody who would like to, to have that. Let me just make sure I get the right one here. So if at the end of the day, you'd like to, have this, um, you know, let me know and I'll send it to you. So uh, about, um, I guess it's been two decades ago, I would get a lot of people who would call me and ask me to help them with their strategic consulting. And as we did the strategic consulting, they'd ask me back year after year to help them. I keep saying, well, what happened to last year's strategy? And the, the, what became obvious was that while they had been able to figure out what their strategic intent was, and we can break down the difference between that and strategy later, because they're not the same thing. They're having a very hard time driving it to the front line and having people execute quickly against those strategic objectives. And um, it gave me an opportunity to think about the principles that were involved in that. And in that process, we came up with what we call sport and the company that I'm building right now called Growth Sport. And I'll, I'll tell you what each of those, uh, the acronym stands for, but but really what you're going to see is that all of these principles you can find in, in lots of different places. It's, it's not the uniqueness of the principles. It's really about how you apply those. So let me talk about what I think the issue is here. We talk a lot about change management and change leadership, this ability to come into an organization and constantly be iterating against your strategic intent. The challenge is, and I think this is the this is a ubiquitous leadership challenge, is connecting that strategic intent to the organization's day-to-day -day execution. What I found is that companies get pretty good at one or the other. They come in, they're like, hey, we're pretty good at understanding what we should do strategically, but we're not so great at executing. That's kind of like running a race where you know where the finish line is, but you kind of you, you, but you, you can't really kind of get started on it, right? Then there's the other organization that is not really sure where it's headed, but it's great at the day-to-day. -day. It just it kind of knows what its core business is. I call these these companies are really good at doing the whirlwind every day. It's kind of good at their DNA. It's kind of like running a race where you're running fast, but you don't really know where you're going. Uh, if you can connect those two things, then you get really effective leadership. Uh, let's see if I can. There we go. Here's the problem. Most people, most organizations don't really understand that results and culture are not interdependent. I'm sorry, are not independent. They are interdependent. They're intertwined. 
and that results really require change leadership. So I'm going to say something right here. I don't think you can really get where you want to go as an organization without really strong process. So what process do you run that everyone agrees to in your organization that helps define the rules of the road so that everybody understands how you work together as an organization? So I'm going to throw that out there that whatever it is you do, you need a process. And that process should be reflective of your principles, your values, your mission and vision, all the things that you want to accomplish. Okay, I'm not sure why each time this gets hard. There you go. Uh, I think that this change leadership's challenge is primarily a culture challenge. And a culture in your organization, for me, is around three key areas. Um, they're around alignment engagement and accountability. Um, and I'll tell you what I mean by each one of those things and how to get to those. But but let me let me just show you this. This was a 20 year research project um, all around strong culture companies. And they defined culture with this performance enhancing culture, which really meant, did they understand where they were going and did they have the processes to accomplish that? And you can just kind of look really quickly at what the differences are. Revenue growth, employment growth, stock price growth, net income growth, all of these things are impressive gaps, deltas between um, companies and organizations with strong culture and those without strong culture. So here's the big write it down moment um, that I've come to. Great culture eats strategy for lunch every day. If you start with strategy and try to get back to culture, it's very difficult. But if you get to culture and you understand how to keep an organization aligned, engaged, and accountable, your strategy becomes clear. The way you're going to achieve that becomes clear. And the foundation of those great, um, the, the great culture and organizations is you know is ownership it's it's are you the ceo of your space so those are a few things that uh just understanding across all of the different organizations that i've seen now what happened is i was working with these companies as we sat back and said all right who does this really well where do we see this done the best and from my perspective i think that professional sports teams do this do this better than any other organization if you think about it they have a very clear understanding of what their objectives are. And most of them will tell you, I want to win a championship or we want to win the division or we want to get, you know, break 500 this year, whatever it is. They have a very clear idea of what it is they want to accomplish. Notice too, that it's not a hundred things. It's one big thing or two big things. Focus is really important for those kinds of organizations. Then they say, all right, who are the team members? What are they going to do? What are the roles they're going to play? Does everybody understand what it is they do to contribute to us achieving that goal? Again, it's very clear. If you think about what that operations look like every day, everyone knows what they contribute to that organization reaching its goals. Then these organizations do something that most business organizations don't do. So if you think about this, I'm a, I'm a big college football fan. I like a lot of different kinds of sports. But if I think about a college football team that plays a game on Saturday, it could be a professional team on Sunday. On Monday, that team is getting together and they are reviewing film. So I want you to think about that in light of what that would mean for an organization. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been a part of a film review of a, a sports team of any kind, but there's really no place to hide, right? When the coach is calling you out, good or bad, it's very uncomfortable or it's very um, empowering because it's all about what you have done to contribute. But it's also clear what needs to be done to be improved in terms of the organization reaching its goals. So we thought, how would we pattern an organization after that if we built a process that we could think about you know, identifying the key strategic objectives, identifying what each team member would do and how they would do it, and making sure that they were aligned, engaged, and accountable around those objectives. So we said, all right, what does that look like? How do you measure winning? And you can ask this for your own organization right now. How do you know if you're winning? Are you winning? What would be the evidence of you winning? Um, and I think a lot of times when I've asked this question before, people are like, I don't really know. I feel like we work hard. I feel like we get things done. But I don't really know what winning looks like. I don't really even know where my scoreboard is or what it would say. So that's one thing to think about for your org right now. 
The second thing around culture is you're like, all right, if we think about how do we optimize the results in the organization? And again, these are things that are that are outcomes that we all care about, whether they're revenue, whether they're market share, whether it's finding product market fit, whether it's, you know, um, whether it's co competition with a with a key competitor. All of these things are the results we're looking to accomplish. These numbers are actually very old now and they're almost they're almost quaint and kind of funny. But uh, at, at the time when Apple from 2005 to 2015, um, you can just kind of see what Apple was able to do over that period of time. I don't know if any of you know where Apple is today, but that 669 billion is now almost 2 trillion. Um, and so that focus around how do we get where we want to go is a key question in terms of what is the business trying to accomplish. So let's talk a little bit about alignment. Um, I've been with a lot of companies that have a lot of people that are working very hard, rowing very hard. And if you think about that, you're like, all right, if I'm rowing hard, I must be doing good things. But if you think about this in a rowboat, I can be rowing really hard. And if we're all rowing in different directions, that boat is at best just spinning. It's not really going where you want to go. I don't know if you've seen these Ivy League row teams. When I was at the University of Notre Dame, they have a very competitive row team. Uh, it's interesting to watch those teams. By the way, not everybody in the boat rows. Everyone in the boat, but one person rows. One person there is calling out a cadence. And that cadence of the rowing is also important. So if you think about direction and cadence, both of those become very important principles for the organization. If people are rowing hard in opposite directions and you aren't aligned, then you're unlikely to get where you want to go. If you get your staff engaged, if you get the team engaged and everyone's moving in the right direction, you also get really interesting outcomes. So I don't know if you can see these numbers, but um, engaged companies have much lower negative uh, metrics and much better positive metrics. So absenteeism, better by 37%. Turnover in high turnover orgs, better by 25%. And in low orgs, better by 40 or by 60%. Shrinkage, theft, better by 28%. Um, safety incidents, you can go through the board. And then on the positive ones, productivity and profitability are all better as well. This is another thing to think about with your org. Almost always in any organization, you can break out your people into these three buckets. You've got a group of people that are completely engaged. They really want what's best for the org. You got another group on the other end that are just there for themselves. And no matter what you do, they're probably not going to engage. And then you've got a group in the middle that could go either direction. And one of the interesting things is, is that most leaders focus on the top or the bottom. That's the easiest place to focus. But I'm going to argue that the best place to focus here is in the middle. How do you get those middle 52 to 60 percent onto the engaged and, and, and operating standpoint? If you can do that, it actually shines a very clear light on your 19 percent or your 20 percent who are not engaged. And you can quickly help them off the boat and into a more uh, appropriate position at Taco Bell or, or something like that. So. Um, this is something to think hard about in terms of whether your people are engaged and and maybe how to get them engaged. I'm not going to spend time on that as well. I think that, um, again, the outcomes for engaged organizations are much, much higher and better. The other thing that I want to talk about is accountability. So we talked about um, alignment, getting everybody in the same direction, getting people engaged, making sure that they know how they contribute to the outcomes. And now accountability. Accountability is a topic that people talk a lot about, um, but it's actually very hard to do. Traditional accountability is kind of us to everybody else, whether that's our team members, our leaders, but it's really about us in the middle of this. I'd like to present a, a new idea that growth accountability is really multidirectional. It's everyone to everyone. It's leaders accountability to teams. It's teams accountable to other teams. It's teams accountable to those that report to them. And it's also accountability within the team. If you can get to this kind of accountability, you get much different outcomes um, than just regular accountability. And if you, we call this scores and this, if you put these together, you increase your score. So how do you do that? Um, I'm gonna skip this slide as well. We think that there's a solution. Our solution we call sport. Again, this is a methodology that we've come up with that is very similar to others. Whether you run 40X or Lean or Six Sigma or the entrepreneurial operating system, all of these processes run very similar um, principles. So there's nothing really special about the principles. It's just in kind of the way that the, the process comes together to work uh, to get to these results. So 
let me tell you what each of these mean and how we get there. But first, I, I mentioned the whirlwind. If you think about the whirlwind and whether you call this, you know, the fire, the whirlwind, the tornado, the day job, um, here's the challenge. You, if you break this out into a quadrant of important and urgent, you get four areas. So you get important and urgent, important, non-urgent, uh, not important, urgent, and not important, non-urgent. It turns out that most of our daily activities are spent in the important and urgent and not important, but urgent. So the two left quadrants. And if you think about that, at one level, that's very intuitive. At one level, it's not. The intuitive level is, is that, okay, if it's important and urgent, it's hair on fire, unless you're guys like me and don't have any hair. It's like, we're trying to get things done. It's obvious we need to work there. But the interesting thing is, is that when we get those tasks done, we often will go to the urgent, not important, because it feels like it's important because it's urgent, but we're not really good at differentiating between what's urgent and important and what's urgent and not important. Oftentimes the next quadrant we'll go to actually is not important, not urgent. They're distractions. They're things that, you know, we don't, we, we kind of are like, maybe I, I need a little time to rest here. I'm gonna play a little solitaire or whatever it might be. But what goes often ignored is the non-urgent, but very important. And the reason is, is because these things can be, you can, you can just, you can procrastinate these. You can put these aside. They're not urgent, but they're very important. One of the things that we found is if you can put a process together, if you can get a methodology that gets you small bites out of the non-urgent but important every day, you are strategically at a much higher advantage than your competition. And this is what we're really trying to do. We're saying, you know what, if I could eat a little bite of that elephant every day so that at the end of the year, I've actually accomplished my strategic goals, then I've really done something that most of my competitors can't do. And you can do a little test for yourself. Just ask yourself, have we ever as an organization made objectives, strategic objectives that we have not attained? That at the end of the year, we look at each other and we're like, we worked hard, got a lot done, but we didn't get the most important things done. And for whatever reason, those things got procrastinated. Okay, so how do we do this? Here's what we looked at. We said, we think there are five things that you should do that will help you get to these urgent, I'm sorry, not urgent, but important outcomes, help you get your team aligned, engaged, and accountable. The first thing we say is you need to be strategically aligned as an organization. So this is, we, we think about this in terms of an arch, not as a pyramid, but you think about those things at the base that are the foundation. We call these the mission, vision, values, you guys probably all have them. At least they're on a plaque somewhere in your organization, whether you really have memorized them or know what they mean or internalized them is a different story. But this is really the foundation of your org. Why do you exist? Where are you going? How are you getting there? What are your big objectives that you're trying to achieve? Is this market share? Is this, you know, is this strategic, is this, is this product market fit? Is this traction? Is this scale? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? If you take that then and break it down through the organization, and we call this deconstruction, what you do is start at the top of the organization with your mission, vision, values, and your key objectives. Then once you've come up with those key objectives, you can come up with one or two primary goals. Goals and KPAs, by the way, are not the same thing. KPAs are metrics, dashboard metrics on the health of the organization. Goals are gaps to close. These are X to Y's by when that if you achieve makes the organization better. So one is an indicator of health. The other is an objective that you want to achieve. By the way, you can have hundreds of KPIs at a time. You can literally only have one to three good goals at a time. Otherwise, at the top of the organization, otherwise you will get defocused and you won't achieve what you're trying to accomplish. Now, does that mean you only have one to three goals in the whole org? No. What it means is, is that every organization under that top level should build their one to two goals or one to three goals based on the goals above them. The question you should be able to answer is, if I achieve the goals at my level, is that the best contribution to achieving the goals at the level above? So if your, level, if your highest level goal, let's say it's, I want 20 new logos for my customer, for my company this year. That's our top line goal. 
Then at the sales, you can say, all right, what is my goal in sales to get those 20 new customers? It might be number of presentations, number of proposals, number of, you know, uh, of the sales that you make, number of closings, whatever that get us there. If I'm in development, it might be number of releases. It might be number of new features or responses. It might be time to release. It might be a number of things that get us the products that would drive these customer logos. If I'm in operations, it might be, you know, hirings or, you know, adherence to process. It could be lots of different things that would make sure that those goals above get accomplished. That's the strategic alignment. This strategic alignment ends at what we call key performance activities as different from key performance indicators. This is the keystone of the arch. These are the day-to-day -day behaviors. We're gonna track these by week that we think if we got done would move the needle on our goals. These, by the way, are not to-do lists. I can't stress that enough. We're not talking about what we're doing in the whirlwind. We're talking what we're doing outside the whirlwind. We're talking about what we're working as much on the business as we're working in the business. These are the things that if left undone would keep us from accomplishing those key objectives that we're trying to accomplish. That's the keystone. If you can get this set up this way, then, and this is an example of a company, then across the top, you've got your mission, vision, values. Then you've got your primary goals, then your strategic goals. Each one of those have strategic milestones. That leads to a strategy, which is a set of different things that if you implement will help you get to your strategic goals. And then at the front line, you have KPAs. These are the things that people agree and commit to do as a team week to week to make sure that we accomplish what we wanna get done. Now, some of you might be saying, wow, that sounds like micromanaging. It's actually not, it's actually the reverse of that. No leader tells anyone else what they have to do. Everyone in the org should be the smartest person at their job, and they should be telling the team what the right thing is to do. By the way, if you're telling people you're going to do certain KPAs and it doesn't move the needle on your goal, you'll know very quickly that they're the wrong things to do. And it'll be, become very transparent in a learning org way that what you're doing isn't working and that needs to be changed. But then the way you change that as an organization is actually innovation. I'm going to say something that may not be immediately obvious, but is very powerful. Your strategic differentiation depends on your ability to innovate at the front line. Your, in, your ability to find out what the key performance activities are that actually move the needle is the difference between the very best performers, the mediocre performers, and the very bad performers. So I think that's where strategic differentiation really takes place. Hey, Brian, I just want to make sure we've got time for Q&A. Um, so if people do have questions, throw them in the chat. And then... Um, get, get Spencer, give me really quickly, when should I be done with this? Because I can move through these really quickly. Um, probably in the next couple of minutes. Okay, I'm going to just move really fast. Strategic alignments working on the business. Personal performance, I'm just going to say really quickly, get the right people in the right seats on the bus at the right time. Do you have the skills to get your strategy accomplished? It's a key question. It's not an easy outcome, but one you need to think about, okay? This is working on ourselves as getting the right skills. Operational execution is the right, if you think about this, right process, right systems, right resources, the right capital, just make sure that's all aligned. I can't go off and do the strategy if I don't have the right budget, or I can't get to the right you know, outcomes if I don't have the right organizational structure. So just make sure that these are aligned. This is working in the business, making sure the business runs the way that it needs to. Results accountability is where the rubber hits the road, uh, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. What we did here is we said, we should do what we call a weekly game review. This is a weekly meeting. 30 minutes, we do three things. Everybody says, this is what I said I would do last week. This is what I got done. This is what my goals look like this week. And this is what I'm going to do next week. Okay. This meeting, 30 minutes, every team member does this. Transparency is very clear on what everyone's working on in that week. This is what I think where the real power of the methodology takes place. This is really about measuring performance and making that performance transparent across the organization. By the way, this will make it so that your low performers can't hide and your high performers get all of the accolades and all of the credit that they deserve. 
The last one we have on here, the T, the team strength. This is about bringing up your lowest performing teams to meet your highest performing team. So think about low performers in a team coming up to your highest performers in a team and your low performing teams up to your highest performing teams. This is really incremental best practice learning in your organization, which is really critical to the iteration of this whole cycle. So you think about strategic intent and alignment where we started all the way to the front team operation, then what you learn, you rinse, wash, rinse, repeat, and you start this over into a virtuous cycle. Okay, so again, this is working on the team in terms of the way that you focus on in your business. Uh, I'll just really quickly, let me just stop the share and I'm just gonna just show you that we, this is, I should have maybe paced myself just a little bit better here. I'm gonna share this really quick. We built a tool to do this. Uh, this is not a platform, this is a tool, it's a hammer to a nail. If, if you think about this, and this is an actual, this is we've done for growth sport. This is a dashboard. You have a team through here. You have your mission, vision, values. Uh, we do this on a season. It breaks it out by week. Um, you've got goals that you can see uh, for every team member, where you should be, where you are. Breaks it out by milestones. Um, you, We have your KPAs in here. If you look, it shows everything that you should be doing week to week. And then we actually go through a game review process where you can literally... By team lead, by team member, um, go through and see what everybody in the organization is doing. So this manages your game review meetings. It manages all your goals. You can see that I can see for every team member how the performance is happening, who's working on what. You go through and you uh, can talk about what everybody is doing for each week. We've got a goal leader view in here that shows every single goal in the organization. And the cool part about this is that you can also um, – you can go through this by team, by team member, by individual, by goal type. And this just goes through and shows you everything that's happening with the org. So I'll stop there and we can have questions uh, if anybody has any. I know I blew through that pretty quick. That's great, Brian. I think there will be some questions. So there's a couple in the chat and mine was similar to Parker. So uh, in the audience here, you've got some people who are solopreneurs or maybe they're first time founders or repeat founders, but it's a, it's a very small team. How do these principles apply to the smallest of small teams? Yeah, so I've actually seen this implemented with teams of three and four, even in the solopreneurs though, Spencer, we had a really interesting aha. We had a few gig workers who came and said, you know what, this process will work amazing for me. My team just isn't all part of my employees. Like that part of them are my clients, part of them are my partners, part of them are my suppliers. And they just built their teams based on these external people that were also part of their, their universe. So their team included these other people that they needed to hold accountable for the outcomes or that they needed to be held accountable to for the outcomes. And it works just as well. Hmm. Tanner, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Brian. This is uh, awesome. I uh, really enjoyed it. I was My question was around like um, maybe some objectives um, that that you folks internally run into shifting this idea from like this would be a nice tech to have to like this is essential for our organizational success right yeah that's a great question so tanner one of the things we're very fond of saying is is that a lot of times you don't know what you don't know before you know it and the, 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 what you, again, this comes back to my first premise, which speed to iteration is the differentiator. It's also the killer. I mean, right now, Tesla is going through this in spades, and you can see how they are at a critical moment to think if how they're going to get to that next level. Whereas someone like Google that is on top of this and really moving this, and then you can think about Kmart that was unable to do it at all. What we found is, is that take a hypothesis, your best guess, put it in the system, run this process against it and you'll know very quickly whether it's the right thing to do. The problem with a lot of orgs is they just, since they're not systematic against what they're doing against their, their strategy, they never know if the strategy is any good or not. But if you pick a strategy and you run against it for 90 days, you'll see very clearly, is this the right thing or not? If not, iterate, change, because you've been rigorous against it, if that makes sense. This calls everything out and makes it transparent so that you can make great leadership decisions. But it's really hard to know beforehand. You almost have to you have to make your best guess and run it.
Um, there was a maybe similar question to what, well, you were just talking about earlier, Brian, about um, tips on building great culture when your team has the distraction of other professional obligations. Is it easier to change culture or change employees? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to find. If you are, are really um, intentional about your culture, you will find that people self-select into your organization or self-select out of your organization. So you're going to see both. If you get strong culture, you're going to get people who will change to match. They'll morph to match your culture because they want to. But the people who don't want to be a part of it, will, will they'll opt out. And that's that's a good thing, right? You want people that are so that are aligned. Look, I'm I'm all about diversity across thought and opinions and all these other things. But culture isn't isn't constraining around those things. Culture really is about the ways we get things done, not about the knowledge or our perceptions that we bring to it. So in this case, you have a real opportunity to to set the culture and define that which will attract the right people and keep the right people. Uh, Landon's asking for recommendations on books yes we're on the concept yes absolutely um there's a lot of great processes out there that and all of these would work if you you know if you run um the four disciplines of execution has a great book um eos and traction has all of these are the same principles if you go out to our website we have a youtube uh, channel as well. We have a DIY um, structure we're putting in place right now that you guys can go out and it's all free. You can get all of these principles. You can download and check those out and apply those. Um, we're also going to work with Taylor. He doesn't know this yet, but we're going to offer something special through him that if you guys want to get together and get more information, we'd be happy to help as well. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of those kinds of places you can go for more information for sure. Okay. And then um, from Jeff, suggestions or reference re resources on the KPAs. I, uh, I know a lot of us are familiar with KPIs, but maybe KPAs was a new new term today. Yeah. So key performance activities, uh, we call them that because we think it's really descriptive of what they are. You, you may have heard these called other things like lead measures, lead measure behaviors, leading behaviors. The, the idea is to separate the inputs from the outputs. And sometimes we get these confused, right? We're like, oh, I have a goal today. Well, no, my goal is what I'm trying to do over time. It's a it's a gap I'm trying to close. It's, a, it's an output measure. It's a lag measure. What am I going to do to get that goal done? That's a key performance activity. That's a leading behavior or a lead measure. So those are always activities or behaviors. The concept is pretty simple. The implementation is a little more difficult because sometimes it's hard to differentiate between those two things, if that makes sense. Okay. Any last questions? Again, Jeff, we'll throw some uh, we'll throw some stuff up on our YouTube channel and our web page that you can go and, and download for free to, to get more info on that as well. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Happy to do it. All right, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We'll see you next week, same time. Invite your friends. Tell your family. We'll see you then. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Brian. Appreciate it. See you, everybody. We'll see you.